welcome, well, well, welcome. <laughs> welcome to your Mac Life for Wednesday, January the 22nd, 2020, show number 1,241. I'm your host, Sean King. Thank you guys very much for joining us here this week. Hopefully you guys will watch the video, get uh, that, that, that little bit I did from castlelabs.io, K-A-S-S-E-L, labs.io. It's actually kind of cool. You, um... Let me just go back to, I'll, I'll show you. They've got a couple. They've got a Star Wars intro that you may have seen on last week's show. And they've got a um, Game of Thrones intro uh, that I used on this week's show. You can see it here. That uh, you just, All you do is just fill in the inputs below, the orders left to right, top to bottom. Um, and you just add people's names or comments or wh whatever it is that, that you want to have on screen. Click the play button down at the bottom. And it, it plays a video for you. You can also download. You can pay them to, to uh, send you a, a video of your your um, file, which is kind of cool. It was kind of fun to play around with and find folks' names and post up there. So hopefully you guys saw your name up there. Thanks very much to our big money PayPal uh, donate donators, subscribers. I appreciate you guys and put you at the very top of the list. On tonight's show, as always, oh, by the way, no, there you notice her sitting over here, is, sorry, over there, is not Melissa. She's not feeling well tonight, so um, she'll be back next on next week's show. Um, on tonight's show, we talk to our good friend Jim Darrenpo of The Loop at loopinsight.com. As per usual, we're going to talk about Apple and encryption. It blowed up this last few days, uh, not only with the FBI, but now with the Reuters story that says that Apple has decided to not encrypt our iCloud backups in order to support the FBI. Well, one of those two things is true, definitely, but one of the other things may not be being reported correctly. We'll talk to Jim about that. It's obvious the first one is true, the second one is not. Apple's always said, not always, but Apple has said we've known since 2016 that uh, iCloud backups are, while they are encrypted, Apple also has one of your encryption keys. So, uh, they're not uh, completely secure from all prying eyes. We'll talk about that a little more with Jim later on. Tim Cook was in Ireland to pick up uh, an award. And during that uh, award speech, he said many things. But one of the things I, that really um, tweaked me was, uh, AR will pervade our entire lives. Now, he didn't give any kind of time frame for that. But I want to talk to Jim about whether he believes that will be true, and at what time frame does he think that will be true? I don't know if pervade, meaning everywhere, will be accurate mm, next 10 years. I don't think so. I don't think it'll be pervasive from the point of view of everyone using it all the time inside the next 10 years. I think inside the next five years, it's still going to be a, a geeky, nerdy, gamer type thing used in very specific instances. Um, as I've always said, uh, it's going to be very, very hard for Apple or any other company to convince those of us who don't wear glasses or even those of us who do to get glasses. That's going to be, I think, the biggest issue. It's just going to be a fashion if issue, if nothing else. Um, the, uh, uh, the guy I, I rip on a regular basis, Mark Gurman, said on... Twitter last week. I'm oh, sorry. I, I, I can't go to German's feed because he's gotten blocked. So I got to go to a, use a different browser to show you. To show you. Hang on. Now I got to go to Safari and open up Safari. So I can show you these tweets from German. Unless he actually pulled it. No, no. Go away. Go away. Hang on. Hang on. Here, you guys in the RC chat room can. See it for yourselves. So, <clears throat> German made this comment. He said he's very impressed with Nreal's new AR glasses. This is what Apple is aiming for. No, they're not. <laughs> there is no way on God's little green earth that Apple is aiming for something that looks that freaking ugly. Look at these things. No. Hang on, let me blow this up. There is no way Apple is going to do anything like that. No. <laughs> Nowhere near 
that. That is not what Apple is aiming for. German? Anyone else who believes that? There's no way Apple would ever produce something that but ugly. And that's the problem. Eyeglasses are very personal. They're in your face. They're on your face. They are something that shows you to the world. And I can't imagine it being very easy for Apple to, you know, for, for the most part, one size iPhone fits all. You know, the, 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 in, in varying degrees, the iPhone size is the iPhone size. It is what um, we're all used to and we all have. But we don't all have the same eyeglasses. We don't all have the same use for eyeglasses. We all, everyone wants, eyeglasses are very much a fashion statement. Maybe even more so, or sorry, an individual fashion statement. Maybe even more so than um, your phone. Or even your watch, for that matter. Although watch is, I think, closer fashion statement-wise to eyeglasses than the phone is. When I got these eyeglasses, I didn't care about the glass bits. I wanted to know how they looked on my face. That was the most important aspect of it for me. The doctor made the prescription. He tested my eyes. He said, okay, you need this, this, and this. I don't care. What I want to know is, will those bits of glass or plastic look good in the frames that I like? If they don't, I'm not getting those glasses, those pieces of plastic. We care about how our eyeglasses look. And that's why when you go into Sunglass Hut or, or your local optometrist shop or optician, there's a thousand different styles of eyeglasses different shapes and different colors and that and apple's not going to do that I, I can't see apple getting into that end of the business where they have to cater to that sort of individuality that specificity of eyeglasses for their ar and that being the case how is apple going to sell us this rumored ar stuff that they're coming across i don't know but tim cook says ar will pervade our lives so we'll talk to jim about what that means to him going forward. If you have any thoughts on that, as always, send me emails to uh, sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. We're also going to talk about preparing for a photo shoot. I don't know if you guys saw this on the, um, the loop earlier this afternoon when I posted it. This has got to be one of the... Let me grab this real quick. One of the coolest photos you'll ever see. This shot was not an accident. This shot was not some guy going, oh, look, a guy in a camel and a solar eclipse. I'll just take a picture. No, this took days, weeks, if not months of planning and preparation down to the literal minute to get this shot. We'll talk about that, the, uh, creating this shot and, and how you can not create this shot, but what the purpose of of um, in, in the movie industry, it's called pre-visualization. You'll often see in the, the credits of a movie, the pre-vis team, where you hear someone on a, on a behind-the-scenes video talking about pre-vis. And that's what this was. It started off as a pre-visualization. Uh, the, the photographer saw what was happening in his mind's eye and then created it technically. So we'll talk about that a little later on in the show as well. Um. Uh, apropos of nothing, when's the last time you flew? For me, it's been uh, quite a while. Australia, two years ago, uh, more than two years ago, Australia. Luckily for me, I haven't seen it very much, if at all. Yeah, probably two or three times in the last 10, 15 years. Service animals on flights, guide dogs for the blind, those kinds of people. Well, the um, the days of flying with your emotional support peacock may be over. Thank God. The Department of Transport announced on Wednesday it's seeking public input on proposed changes to current rules that allow some travelers to fly with their emotional support pets, which in recent years have reportedly included everything from hamsters to reptiles, horses, and even peacocks. <clears throat> now, I sympathize with the plight of the disabled, either physically, emotionally, whatever. But there's got to be a line drawn in the sand. And I think that line is, if you want to have an emotional support 
animal, any emotional support animal, you need verification from somebody. You can't just walk up to the ticket agent and go, this is my emotional support pony. It's happened. Literally, it's happened. People have taken, I'll show you the picture. People have taken horses on planes as their supposed emotional support animal. There's a tiny horse, a miniature horse on a plane. Because the person said that they needed it for emotional support. Maybe you do, but I want a doctor telling me that. I don't want you just doing it so you can bring your pet to grandma. It's got to be a legitimate, medically approved reason for doing it. Guide dogs have to be certified. You can't just let anyone have a guide, call their dog a guide dog, any blind person, because then you can't sell to a blind person because then they'll get killed. But if you if you claim these kinds of things, you got to be able to back it up. You can't just say, you know, flying is bad enough for so many of us. Having to deal with your emotional support pony, having to deal with your emotional support horse, hamster, iguana is you know it's enough that's enough we, we don't we don't need it we don't want it again i'm sorry if this is in fact a, a real issue for you but you got to understand that many of us are going to call bullshit on that it doesn't feel right we get the idea of emotional of, of guide dogs for the blind we're used to that we're getting around the idea of emotional support animals but it's got to be verifiable. You can't you can't just bring these creatures, your goat, on a plane. It's bad enough flying as it is, but I don't want to sit next to someone who's got a pony. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, that, Monty, there has to be some reasonable limits to the type of animal. Also, to the size of the animal. One of the things is that um, the animal has to be able to fit in the uh, in, in between your legs without you, uh, you know. Basically, the animal's going to fit underneath the seat in front of you. Your pony ain't doing that. So, yeah, I saw this story and just thought, oh, God, I hope so. Fly, like I said, flying is bad enough without having to deal with all that kind of stuff. Later on in the show, we're going to be talking in our starting point for photography segment, we're preparing for the shoot, pre-visualizing, and talking about this amazing photo that this photographer took in the desert in, in Arabia during a total annular eclipse. But up next, we're going to talk to our good friend Jim Downpour of The Loop at Loop Insight. Dot com, all that and much more coming up. This is your Mac of Life. Your Mac Life.
Welcome back, folks. Thank you guys very much for joining me here this Wednesday evening. On our phone, we've got our good friend Jim Darren for the Loop at loopinsight.com. Jim, how you doing? I'm doing good. How was your Christmas? Oh, wait, we did that already. <laughs> I was going to say. That's <laughs> <laughs> mess with me right off the top, dude. Jeez. You didn't let me get warmed up or anything. It's just like, man. So, would you want to be in Tim Cook's shoes right now today with all of this FBI stuff and Reuters and those kinds of things? Do you think Cook is, is I don't want to say this as pejorative as, as it sounds, do you think Cook is hiding out, avoiding the media, or is this business as usual? Well, I mean, I don't think anybody wants to be in the position of going up against the U.S. government. Yep. But, you know, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm sure his day would be a lot easier if he didn't have that crap to deal with. How much of the Reuters story do you take at face value? How much of it do you take <sighs> a grain of salt? These stories are never 100% true. They're rarely right. 100% false as well. There's some the grain of truth somewhere in there. I, I just, you know, I, I think I, I look at it the same way that you just said. It's not 100% true. I mean... It's not 100% false, but what is that middle ground? Yeah. Or is it, yeah. you know, how, how far is that uh, move to one side or the other in, in, as far as truthness goes? You know? We, we know, uh, I posted it on the, uh, the loop uh, today or yesterday, that uh, Walt, Walt Mossberg back in 2016 wrote a story about exactly this, that our iCloud data was encrypted, but Apple had a key to it for the reasons um, why we would expect, so that if you lost your, your personal password, Apple could get into your iCloud backup. So that wasn't a surprise to me. The idea that Apple would have gone to the FBI and said, hey, we're thinking about doing this. What do you guys think? That part to me sounds like someone got something lost in the translation of the rumor. That doesn't seem to make sense, given the average serial role Apple's had with the FBI over the last few years. Yeah. Yeah, I... I... You know, Apple has uh, stood up for for privacy, and not just in words, in actions. Yep. They have stood up for privacy. Um, so, you know, that's why some of this just doesn't ring true to me. Yeah. Where I, I, I have to start to question what's being said or the motives, maybe why something is being said. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But there's just something there that, I don't like. It would not surprise me to hear Apple come out sometime maybe next week and say the sources in this story were untrue. We never approached the FBI. No one at Apple spoke to Reuters. But even then, that wouldn't put an end to the story. I think what Apple needs to do is step up and say, this is what we do. This is what we don't do. This is why we do it. This is why we don't do it. Do you think Apple should be more proactive along those lines? Well, I think probably if Apple was going to do anything, it would come out with uh, a, a more, maybe a statement more along the lines of, um, we absolutely care about your security and it is the number one thing for us. And, you know, we, we're not going to jeopardize that under any circumstances. Do you think Apple should make iMessage completely encrypted and that the, what the plan was should now go into place? Well, you know, I, who knows why they, why they didn't do things, why they will do things. I don't know. See, I think Apple knows how many of its customers call them up on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis and say, I lost my password. Could you get me into my iCloud backup? And Apple going, all right, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Okay, yes, here. It's unlocked for you. Apple knows how many people that happens to. And they know that those exact same people would be pissed, be not because of their own problem, but because Apple can't help them if Apple did this end-to-end -end encryption thing. Security and privacy of data is is a is it can, it, it's on a spectrum, you know. And Apple is is doing this dance between absolute security and absolute openness, and they've got to find a middle ground there. I think the middle ground they have now is pretty good. I don't yeah, mind so do that I. they I don't mind that they don't encrypt the iCloud backup, if only because I don't use the iCloud backup. I do my backups locally. I do them encrypted 
on my machine. If you do that, folks, no one can get into your machine. No one can get into your backups without you know brute forcing or, or getting you to change the password. Apple can't do it if it's on your machine, on your Mac or on your PC. So if you have concerns about this stuff, that's what you should do. Don't do iCloud backups. Do local backups. Yeah, see, I do, I do my iCloud backups and syncs and you know all that kind of stuff, and I I still feel pretty safe. You know, do you feel how much of it? How much of you feeling safe is? And I don't mean to put words in your mouth. You knowing you're not a bad guy. You know, I I feel safe ninety five percent of it because I ain't doing nothing bad. I'm not doing anything on iCloud or on my phone that I don't want my mom to see. Uh, yeah. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Well, you well, and I both know that's a lie. My mom's pretty was pretty cool yeah. though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so is my so is my mom. Exactly. She's pretty she's pretty damn cool. So um so I mean I know I I know I know what you're saying and I, I guess that could be part of it, but would I want somebody to be able to hack into my iTunes stuff and change all my passwords and find uh the finances and all that kind of stuff. No, no, I wouldn't want that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and then, you know, it just goes from there to bank accounts to everything else. And no, I'm okay with people not being able to access that stuff. So it's not just a matter of, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong. You still have a private information that you don't want people to have access to. Yeah. I guess my advantage is, is the when you talk about the banking, I have no money, so I don't care. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. So <laughs> dirt poor. If you want to pay my bills? Go ahead, hack my phone. Mm. You know? <laughs> but I'm going to wear a sign next time I go out. Hack, hack my phone. Pay my bills. Pay my bills exactly. But but it's that's a bit of a cop out because we have to be concerned, even if we're not the bad guys. We have to be concerned. We're not doing anything wrong. That's always what people often say. Well, I don't care what the police do because I don't do anything wrong. But we've got to support the civil rights of everybody, not just those that we agree with or that we we like. Um, it's it's a it's a hard issue for Apple. I I do believe though, if nothing else, Apple should early next week, whether it means they bring in a friendly reporter or put out a press release or a letter from Tim Cook. They've got to say something because I think one of the things that is going to happen with Apple if they don't say something is people are going to start getting the wrong impression. And they're going to start – someone uh, posted something that was really a great line. that They said that um, half the people think that Apple is aiding and abetting terrorists and the other half think a Apple is aiding and abetting the FBI. You know, they're, yeah. they're competing a rock and a hard place on this because yeah. – other people are telling Apple's story. And I think it's a real mistake of, of the company in, in, in letting that happen. Well, and, and there is no good way out. Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, they could come out and say something, and it could, you know, blow up in their face. It could come out and not say something. could blow up in their face. No. There is just no good answer. Do you think, bottom line, the FBI forced Apple to, to do this? No. You know, why not? I don't know. I just don't. <laughs> That's helpful. Thanks. That's why I come to you for no. your expertise. <laughs> no, I, you know, I like oh, I no. said, this 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 thing just has a bad stench about yeah, it. Yeah, I agree. And and I don't think that Apple would do or not do something because the FBI said so. Mm -hmm. I really don't. And I don't think that Apple would have gone to the FBI and no. said, "Hey." We're thinking of doing this. Yeah, yeah. What do you what do you, you guys think? Can you give us your opinion? <laughs> That's right. We'd That's really right. like to know. Cause you guys are so good with cyber stuff. <laughs> That's right. You know, I just <laughs> I I can't I, I see that it's just some stuff just doesn't ring true to me. Yeah, exactly. That's so, one of those things that <clears throat> your your company or your executives would have to be in my opinion, remarkably two-faced to do that, to talk about privacy on the one hand, but then go to the FBI and say, hey, what do you guys think about this kind of thing? And I don't think Apple's that kind no. of company. No. I, I don't think I, if, if anything else, that part of the story I think is patently false, that Apple went to the FBI and said, we're thinking about doing this. What do you guys think? Yeah, can you spare any coders? I mean, we're running short <laughs> at the moment. Uh, you know, don't, don't, 
don't put a back door in there. But, yeah. you know, if yeah. you could just help us build this. Just, uh, just give us a little, a little little nudge in the right direction. Yeah. 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 But, but I, and, and this is part of my bias. I'm always a fan of, of full disclosure. I think Apple should step up and tell its users and tell the tech community and the security community, this is what happened. This is what we're doing. Because the reasons for not fully encrypting iCloud backup are perfectly valid. They're, they're good reasons from Apple's point of view. I completely understand why Apple's doing this. They're, they're not fully encrypting it because if and when you screw up and forget your password, we want to be able to help you. So the only people who can get your iCloud backups are us, Apple, and you, and the authorities if they give us a, a, a rightful subpoena. Right. So it's, yeah, it's it's tough on, on Apple's part, but I, I got I to gotta believe that... Um, they're doing the right thing. They're just explaining it poorly, in my opinion. Well, wouldn't wouldn't Apple have to go to the CIA if they were going to do this like um, internationally? God, now now it just got deeper. <laughs> now I just I wonder if they went to the CIA too, and said, you know, <laughs> hey, we're we're coming up with some new features. <laughs> what, what do you think? What, what do you think? Uh, got any coders? The FBI sent in a couple over. Uh, got any you can spare and help us out. You guys can bunk together, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Save money. Yeah. <laughs> because, because I know the other issue is going to be if if this was in fact true, Apple would have to do this with every company, every country's law enforcement and security forces. Right. Because it's different for every. Obviously, every country has different laws, and yeah. Apple has to abide by those laws, as as they said they had. I think it's going to come down to a point where Apple is going to say exactly that. You know what? Screw this. We're going to encrypt everything so nobody can get it. Screw you, FBI. You know, and I think that's this is this is a dangerous game the FBI is playing because if they push Apple into a corner where Apple is forced to say, "Okay, fine. People are upset that we don't fully encrypt or we we fully encrypt, but we also have a a key to their encryption. We're going to encrypt everything and we won't have a key. If you lose your backup, you're hooped." That's what happens on the phone. That's what happens on your on your desktop. If you lose your um, uh, iTunes backup or, or your backup uh, password on your machine, Apple can't help you. So I think yep. maybe the FBI could force Apple's hand and make them do that, and now they'd lose whatever cooperation Apple does give them when it comes right. to bad guys and their iCloud backups. I think this is this is a um, the FBI is I think is handling this all wrong. If, if well, this was leaked, well, and then. Um, you know, those hundred thousand requests that Apple gets for, uh, for, uh, information, they would just send back and say, can't do it. Yep, exactly. And, and you know what, and, and Apple would be not only within its rights, but would also say, you know what, we're going to save ourselves a million dollars a year, but not having to deal with all these freedom of information, sorry, all, all these subpoenas from the government. We can just go, no, we ain't got it. We, we, yep. we, we, we don't have it. Here's the encrypted file. Go nuts here's 10 gigabytes of encrypted stuff you guys figure it out go to your yep. labs and figure it out yourself because we can't do it screw you yeah it is dangerous yeah it is i don't i don't know that that's the place where they want to put themselves that's right but. exactly uh speaking of putting ourselves in a place uh, do you have any sonos gear under the bridge there i do Oh, do you um i do does this uh, sonos legacy plan uh affect you Mm. No, not really. Folks, we're talking about the fact that Sonos has sent a uh, Sonos, the speaker company, has sent a letter out to its users that's saying legacy devices, those five years and older, um, will not get any new updates. Now, the speakers are still going to work as speakers. Sound will still come out of them. But because of the technology behind Sonos, what they're saying is we can't keep up with technology and keep all that stuff backwards compatible with our older speakers. So we're end of life them. We're cutting them off. Yeah. And if you have a mix of older, newer stuff, your Sonos system will only work at the level of your oldest piece of equipment. Do you think right. that's fair of Sonos to say that? Yep. Why? Look, I I've said, uh, for a long, long time, um, in, in this tech business that at some point, I, I've said this to developers, uh, at some point, you just got to you got to make a cut somewhere. Yeah, you can't try to continue to um, uh, to support 
every piece of old hardware and come out with the newest, latest, and greatest stuff that you can do. So if you need to cut people off, cut people off. And if that includes me with my Sonos speakers and whatever, then fine. Cut me off. But it doesn't, I don't think. No, I'm still good. I, I understand why Sonos is doing this. Is there a message here for users, for those who have smart homes, for example? Engadget had an article that said uh, uh, Sonos's legacy plan makes smart homes look silly. This could happen well, with other devices, too. I mean, uh, yeah, Amazon absolutely. could say this. Google could say this. That five years from now, you and know, they will. there's certainly a possibility of that. Of course and they will. All of your smart home devices would no longer work if they were five years yep. older, or seven years, whatever it might be. Yep. <clears throat> this could really slow down the implementation of various smart home ideas from a consumer point of view. If I don't think so. But if consumers think that their Alexa devices will stop working after five years, I'm not going to buy one now. It's going to be disposable in five years. You know what? What? My my mother called me last week and she wants to buy a new ipad okay and she said they have this new one and i can buy it for this much and you know then they have a, a refurbished one and i can do this and i told her don't forget that whatever product you buy in five years will stop receiving support and updates yep. so if you want longevity then get the new one if you if you're okay with being three years from having um, uh, uh, Apple say, okay, iOS does no longer support your device. Now, it could be longer, but typically it's about five years. Yeah. So that's what I told her. I can't tell my mother that and say something different now. Not that you would ever know, but... <laughs> You know, she is a feisty woman. She might call up and get on the chat line or something and say something. But it might give uh, some people pause. But, but how how can it give you pause no matter what you, even if you buy a computer today, even if you buy a computer the day it comes out, it's obsolete. Yes. I mean, no matter what you buy, it's obsolete. So, you know, are you going to have to switch out components in your in your smart home? You know what you should do? get a lock and a key yep you know how long that's lasted centuries like five thousand years <laughs> so the danger uh, is know. the danger is when we go down the path of smart homes when we don't have those backups anymore i've seen smart homes for sale that don't have smart home locks that for sale that don't have a key it's just the device and you use your phone to unlock it if yep. that gets obsoleted by Amazon or Google, whatever company Honeywell might be doing it, you can't open your front door. This isn't this isn't sound not coming out of your speaker. This is you not being able to get into your home. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. And the same with a thermostat. If you've got an electronic smart thermostat, if that gets end of life, you can't adjust the heat in your house or the air conditioning in your house. So I think this does give this will give at least smart consumers pause if not make them not do this but certainly look at devices for example i wouldn't have a smart lock in my home that didn't have a key access to it see i just don't think that people will even think about that yeah. i don't think that they'll consider it yeah. i really don't and it's sad but i don't think that they will yeah it's a shame, but yeah, you're probably right that this will jump up and bite people in the ass and they'll complain about it, and people like us will go, well, you should have known better, but they mm -hmm. they didn't. Tim Cook was in Ireland this past week uh, accepting a, an award, a special recognition award from the... Um, you too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a new album? Oh, shit. <laughs> the, uh, the award was devised by the IDA Ireland and acknowledged... Apple's 40 years in Cork. This is one of those made-up <laughs> awards. This is not the Nobel Prize or anything else like that. Just they made, right. This is the first award they've ever given. It'll be the last time they ever yeah. give it out to anybody. But Cook said something really interesting. He said, I'm excited about AR when talked about the next uh, developments in tech. He expects the next five to ten years. 
I'm excited about AR. My view is it's the next big thing, and it will pervade our entire lives. This is one of those things that I don't think enough people pay attention to. This is Tim yeah. Cook telling you what Apple is going to do in five to ten years. Yeah. He can't be any more clear than this. He is well, telling you the direction <clears throat> of the company over the next Apple five is, years. Apple has said that for the last three or four. Yep. <clears throat> Apple did not get into VR because they didn't believe in VR. Um, they believed in AR. So obviously with AR comes AI and, and machine learning and, you know, all the all the things that go along with artificial intelligence and then you're getting into augmented reality where you know your your computer devices are interacting with the world around you i mean he's been very clear apple has yeah <laughs> they've not made a secret of this that's right <laughs> all of the big all of the big demos that they've had on stage have all been ar <laughs> that's right the apple's never done a vr demo okay all right Stop talking about Apple and VR. It's not happening. They're not interested in it, which I'm glad for, because I think VR is, is, is too niche for Apple. It seems to be really only a gamer thing. And it's cool for games. I, I played a couple of VR games, and it's mind-bogglingly fun. But it's not something that the average consumer is going to want. But is AR? Is augmented reality? Whether it's I want a hologram. <laughs> a holodeck. A hollow deck, yeah. But a whole a hollow deck. whole room in my house dedicated to, to to holograms. It's going to be interesting to see how Apple implement. They are going to implement it, whether it's on the phone or on separate glasses. How is that going to work? I still cannot be convinced, though, that Apple is going to do AR glasses. We talked about this off the top of the show. Mark Gurman posted these ugly, ugly glasses. Now, this is where Apple's going. No, dude, they're not. Apple's glasses will be a fashion statement, but can you see how Apple's going to convince us to wear glasses when we don't want to wear glasses? Well, look, I don't think that we have any idea what Apple's going to do in the AR space. Does Apple have AR glasses? I'm sure they do. Yes. You know, they've probably got AR socks too. They've got <laughs> AR everything. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, where Apple's seeing where the technology can go. They know what they want to be able to do. It's just a matter of getting the technology to get them there. And, you know, I think that they had the same quest with the iPhone and the iPad. Yeah. They know what they wanted to do. But, you know, not all of the technology was there right away to get them there. But when it was, holy crap. And we had some great phones. But the only thing we talk about when we talk about AR are glasses and the phone. Holding your phone up yeah. to your environment and looking at your phone to get the information or having the glasses but, on. But look where we were 10 years ago mm -hmm. and look where we could be in 10 more years, especially how things are growing exponentially. I mean, this is it's, it's going to be huge what could happen in the next 10 years. But, so we we have no idea of even the products yep. that will be around in ten years. So you know it's hard to uh, to say. You know all we know now is glasses and phones. Yeah. Well, God, I mean there there may be three new categories of products by then, all around AR. Yeah. You know maybe you just clip it on your forehead or something. I don't know. I'll be the first one to admit I'm not smart enough to think of anything outside of those two use cases, your phone and glasses. I, I can't. I, I don't, I've been I don't even to know what happened. I don't even know what happened today. So <laughs> I've been yeah, trying I, to think of an alternate use case for, for AR. I can see don't. it for very specific reasons. A uh, cook said when he was uh, accepting his award, imagine an auto mechanic underneath a car with AR glasses for the schematics of the car. You could see exactly where the oil pan plug thingy, I don't know anything about cars, so is. You could see it there and how much torque and all those kinds of things. But for average everyday people walking on the street, the people who Apple sells things to, average everyday consumers, your mom, my mom, those kinds of people, I can't see 
anything that convinces me that Apple can convince them to put on a pair of glasses. Well, I, I think by the time um, that comes around, it will be more like Apple, you are your mom. <laughs> yeah. You know? They don't have to worry about getting your mom to use it. They yeah. need to worry now about getting you to use it. Yep. And like I said, I said off the top of the show, because of the fashion element of eyeglasses, that's going to be another hurdle for Apple to go over. I, don't, I have no doubt they can do the AR part of it. I don't know if they can or want to do the fashion aspect of it. You can't I, I give everyone I, the exact same frames. I wouldn't worry about um, eyeglasses. I, you're 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 stuck in the yeah. 2020s. Yep, yep, I, I'll agree. You know, so, but yeah, you can't give everybody the same, the exact same eyeglasses. Just like you can't give everybody the exact same headphones. Yeah, that's right. I'll, ha I'll have them walking around looking like morons with their white headphones <laughs> in their ears. You know, you speaking, couldn't do that. Speaking of everyone looking the same, I saw a, a post on, on Reddit this morning. It just sort of made me feel so freaking old. First of all, it's 36 years ago today that Apple played the 1984 ad during the Super Bowl. Oh, Snap my time God. Super I know. And then to make it even wow. worse, all the comments in, in the, the Reddit thing was like, I've never seen this ad before. What was this ad for? And like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? Oh. Why was this ad important? Did you have to read the book? I'm like, oh, come on, man. Wow. <laughs> it was so depressing. Literally wow. depressing. And, and see, that's, uh, that, that's when, you, uh, when you just call the internet company and say, yeah, cut it off. <laughs> just cut right. it off. Cut off is the there any Is there any reason? No, just, just, just please, stop it. Just, the, just stop the, whole, it. the whole internet. I didn't see the original one because, as you know, back in those days up here in Canada, bizarrely enough, they wouldn't allow – the American broadcast to show American commercials in Canada. So right, when you right. guys are watching that 1984 ad and being blown away by the ad, we were watching ad for Speedy Muffler King, you know, yeah. <laughs> and Labatt's. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. That, that is very true. They had to time the commercials to be exactly the same as the at length as the American one yeah. so that when they cut back to the game, it would cut back. It was so annoying. Yeah. Yeah, no, no U.S. commercials. The we, uh, the uh, the impact of that um, it's always often been called the greatest single TV commercial ever. That can be debated now with even more commercials over the last thirty six years. The impact of it was immediate. It was played. It was played. Everyone, th a lot of people think it was, only, it was only played once, but it was only played. It was played twice. Once in a film theater in Iowa, so it could. Uh, be eligible for awards and then that one time on the super bowl but it was played over and over again in the news media afterwards right. and it's been obviously been on youtube for the ensuing three, six years i didn't realize it was played twice yes it was played played in 1983 at this one theater in iowa so it would qualify for the award season in 1984 good for you well, that's, i didn't know that there you go that's why they did it that way i watched hmm. it again today i've watched it many times over the years so a lot of the folks on Reddit said it doesn't hold up. I think it does, if only because I know the history of the ad. I know what it's right. based on. I know where Apple was in 1984. I don't know if people, the, the young folks nowadays who didn't either live through that or understand where we were in 1983 and 1984, whether that ad would have the same sort of impact on them now. What do you think? I think it was uh, certainly an important ad. Um, no matter how you look at it, it was a very important ad. And uh, it was certainly way ahead of its time, wasn't it? I, I oh, don't yeah. know. I mean, the ads that I like now are all like the Geico ads. <laughs> <laughs> With the little lizard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the gecko? Uh, and uh, and oh, one of the all geez. the insurance companies down here have the best ads. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Limu, Emu, and Doug. <laughs> yeah, I love Limu, Emu. Oh dear. Yeah, it's so. it's also a lot of folks don't realize it started this trend of the Super Bowl being the most important place to run your ad where you wouldn't get the most bang for your buck. Maybe not so much anymore with it costing ten million dollars for thirty seconds. But that's why 
the Super Bowl ads today are are so talked about and so uh, watched is because that started the whole trend of if you want to make a big splash, you do it at on this particular moment of you know of history. Now that you got me to talk about Limu, Emu, and Doug, I'm thinking about cutting off my internet too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm just gonna call. <laughs> just and, to call. I just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm call done. it a life. Cut it off. Yeah, we're done. Cut, we're, thanks very call much. Call it. Cut it off. <laughs> I don't want to see it anymore. Apple is rumored to be doing a, a podcast expansion into original content that'll include companion content for its Apple TV Plus shows. What do you think of this? Um, I, I guess it depends on how they go about doing it, but you know. People, I I am not a big podcast listener. No. I never have been. Um, but in the past year, I've really gotten into this, uh, you know, true crime podcast yeah. where you have like investigative reporters or investigators looking into cases. And the one I found the most fascinating is called In the Dark. And they, they've done two cases so far in two seasons. One of them was actually just in the Supreme Court of the U.S. because of this podcast. I mean, these two girls that do this podcast are investigative journalists, but they are so good yeah. that it, it's scary to listen to the things that they find. And like I said, this last one, it just went through the Supreme Court. And, you know, I mean, because of a podcast. So if you can do things, I mean, one of Apple's new TV shows is about a podcast. Yes. Uh, truth you know, be told. Which yeah. is, a, truth be told, which is a very good show. Um, I'm almost caught up on all of Apple TV shows now. So I'm I don't know. caught up. Um, I don't know if I would listen to a podcast like that. Because I just don't listen to many podcasts. I think the problem is that, first of all, the content of the podcast is going to be very PR-ish. It's going to be very sanitized. If, if this is from Apple, it's going to be people who are approved of, if not hired by Apple to do these. So you won't find much criticism of these podcasts. It's going to be, uh, sorry, criticism of these shows on these podcasts. I like some podcasts that are focused on a show or on a series, I enjoy those when they come from people who are outside of the creation of that series. You can't be unbiased if Apple is the one supporting your podcast. So I don't think this is a very good idea. And the other reason is we've all got a limited amount of time to listen to podcasts. If Apple starts sucking up some of that time for their fluff, which I think these podcasts will be, it means other podcasts have to go by the way, wayside. And well, maybe, maybe those much, are bad podcasts that go by the wayside, but some good podcasts will stop being listened to as well. How is Apple's going to be more fluff than, I mean, Apple will have access to the actors and everything else. How could that be more fluff than, you know, somebody that just likes the show that does a podcast about it and doesn't know anything. But at least the person who isn't involved directly in the show will have a more, if not unbiased, certainly a more honest opinion about the show. I can't, I can't see a podcast <coughs> with Jason Momoa talking about C, talking about all the issues that people have with the show. You know, with the with the fighting and the the un unrealisticness of it and things like that. Um, What's unrealistic? Blind uh, people I'm, can't I'm, fight like that. Yes, they can. No, they cannot. Yes, they can. I've beaten if, up if, several if... blind people. They can't fight for <laughs> shit. <laughs> and there we. You have just it. tap them on the yes, shoulder yes. and move left. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> it ain't that hard to take their wallets. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Every, everybody in Nova Scotia knows that. Come on. <laughs> There's a whole school uh, of deaf and blind kids <laughs> used to beat up in Halifax. <laughs> um. I, I just, I, I think the premise is that since they've been like this for generations, that the yes, they do have a heightened sense of awareness and they can fight like that. So yeah, I, I mean, for people who who you know say stuff like that, I just think that they are they never wanted to immerse themselves in the show, and 
all they want to do is complain about something. Well, no. I mean, we're talking about this particular show. Jason Momoa can't act. Okay, he's a he's a terrible actor. Just even without the issues I have with the the setup of the show, and the fact that the biggest issue I had was they they make it sound like blind people would just turn into cavemen once they became blind. They couldn't function in no, our presence. That's, that's exactly what the no, show is. They've devolved to no, cavemen. They've devolved. No. They, see, this is the podcast we couldn't do if we were being hired. hired because by you're, and that's you're, my point. You're, you obviously. Uh, have your mind made up about what you think and what you think is wrong. There was like an apocalypse. Nothing survived. It's not that because they were blind, nothing survived. Nothing survived because of whatever happened. That's not what the creators of, ago. That's not what the creators of the show have so said. You, you're just, you're just so wrong. I can't believe sometimes how wrong you are. I'm you going are, by okay. what the creators of the show you, have said. I just finished watching it. I know, but you and haven't read anything about the creators of the show. Did you read the very first thing that popped up on episode one? You might want to go look at it again. Okay, I will. Yeah, do that. <laughs> but anyway, this my point uh, is, this is the kind I of discussion. I accept your apology already. I, I have not yet apologized. We, you'll have to wait a week. But this, But this is the kind of thing that you couldn't get on an Apple-supported podcast. That's my point. Oh, I know. I think you could, if Apple did it right, and that's what I said. It depends on how they do it. True. Okay. Fair enough. We'll 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 okay. leave we'll leave it at that. Um, right. what's the other thing I see? I threw you for a loop there. Didn't you I? did. You really did. You messed me up completely. I've thrown off my entire schedule of. You 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 expected all of a sudden you were just going to rule over everything and then. <laughs> Steamroller you. Little <laughs> did you know that I had just finished watching C. <laughs> what else have you what else have you finished watching? Um I still have I think one more show for all mankind. I'm done with uh the morning show and I'm done with Servant. And what what did you think of the ending of Servant? Or, or Servant overall? Well, I I just I think the same thing every time. Like I could pee myself at any minute watching the servant because <laughs> it's just so goddamn creepy. It's... I could never live near or around M. Night Shyamalan. I couldn't because <laughs> no kidding. the things that go through his head are just freaky. Imagine this guy at Halloween. Like, Jesus, what is wrong with you? I, yeah. I, I, I found the show to be wonderfully creepy, but I still, we still, both Melissa and I agree, we still don't like any of the characters. None of the characters are very likable as characters. But the sh the premise of the show, where they're going with it, is very interesting. And we're still watching know, it because of that. I don't know that you're supposed to like any yeah, of the possibly. characters. Though. Yeah, possibly. I, I mean, it's one of those shows, like, if I had to pick a character that I liked, it would be the brother. It'd be the, ba it'd be the yeah. baby. Yeah. You know, the guy from Harry Potter. The, well, the guy who drinks a lot. That's why you like him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he just drinks all day long. He does nothing else but drink. And right. I really like him. I think he's he's funny as hell. Right. But, yeah. Yeah, the whole show is creepy. Yeah, it's very creepy. So, it's, it's wonderfully creepy, yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, really, I really like that. I haven't gotten to Dickinson yet, but I guess that'll be next. I'm not going. We watched the first two episodes and went, you know what? I'm not an adolescent girl. I'm not going to watch any more of it. Not saying it's oh, bad. Really? I'm not saying it's a bad show. Um, the actress, the lead actress is wonderful. I've seen a bunch of things, but it just there was nothing there for me to, to grab onto because it was so much about teenage angst. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I studied Dickinson in college for one semester. I don't, I don't want to study her again. You know, it just, it just, oh. that teenage angsty girl thing. I just can't get into it. I, I had, I had enough teenage angst. Ex you, <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, Jeez, <laughs> You've got I don't need of any more of that. Uh, for all mankind, um, really was uneven for me. I found that they spent a whole wax of time on the show talking about things that I didn't give a rat's ass about. And I kept saying to the TV, go back to the space stuff. That's what I want to see is the space well, stuff. No, but I, I think that there's more to it than just the space stuff. But yeah, I kind of, I kind of get it. I mean, the first few episodes for me were really slow. Yeah. Um, 
but then it kind of picked up a little bit, you know, so we'll see. And uh, the other big one is uh, The Morning Show. Won awards for mm-hmm. Jennifer Aniston at the Screen, Screen Actors Guild, for Billy Crudup at the um, Critics' Choice Awards. I thought Crudup was the best part of the show. Oh, I, he was absolutely the best. I want to see a show with just him. Just just yeah. Billy Crudup being that guy, because he is del- that, yeah. deliciously smarmy and wonderful and an asshole yeah. and fantastic. Better than the and rest evil. of the cast combined. Yeah. No, he was great. No, he, he was, was absolutely great. Whoever wrote that character needs to write more of yep. those characters and just have a show with them. Exactly, exactly. Uh, there was a whole there were a whole bunch of, of sections of the show that really kind of ticked me off because they were unrealistic. And now that you've finished it, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say when when uh, uh, Mitch, the bad guy in it, showed up in the control room and gave his little speech in the control room with all the staff around, that never would have happened. There is no way in hell that scene ever would have happened. I understand why they felt they had to do the scene, but doing it that way took me out of it completely because I'm like, he wouldn't have gotten past security on the first floor. He wouldn't have gotten on an elevator, let alone stood in the room for 10 minutes. And the only reason you know that is because you haven't heard of Matt Lauer getting into the control room yet. <laughs> well, it's also because they wouldn't let me back in either when I was. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway. Um... <laughs> anyway, yeah. But yeah, so that kind of stuff always makes you go, oh, come on, guys. Don't got to do it that way. Find a different way of doing it. Um, right. But I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I don't think it was a great show, but it's a show I'm looking forward to watching again. Uh, again, if only because of Billy Crudup. He was fantastic. Agreed. The other, uh, what are the other, I think that's pretty much it for me. And it was interesting that Apple just announced this past weekend uh, a slate of a bunch of new shows coming out in February, March, and April. I was worried about this. After we watched Servant, Servant was the last show of Apple TV that we of the shows we wanted to watch. You know, we're not going right. to watch Help Search. We're not going to watch Ghost Riders. We're not going to watch those kinds of shows. Um there's the new show, um, uh, is it Little America that just came out? Yes. And they've got. Yeah, few... I'm, I started watching that. I haven't, I haven't watched any of that, but, but we we certainly will. I think that's yeah, why. Good. I think that's why the price point of Apple TV is is very good at five bucks. As long as they keep adding a, a couple of decent shows every couple of weeks that you can watch, I think five bucks is a fair price. If they were charging more for that, I would be a little ticked off. I would go. Did you fall into your bottles? No. <laughs> Shut up. But um, <laughs> it's it, and the the new shows that are coming out. I'm glad to see the the banker, the movie with um, Samuel yeah. Jackson, is back on the slate. I'm so sorry for the family that had to go through whatever they had to go through. But I think Apple's explanation rings true that no one actually involved in the production of the show. Um, was involved in that family drama, so they're going to go ahead and and show that in March. So I'm looking forward to March seeing that. March the 10th. Yep. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, I can't wait to see that. Folks, that's it from Jim Dalrymple. He has his own podcast. It's up on the iTunes Store. It's called The Dalrymple Report with Dave Mark from The Loop. Check it out on the iTunes Store. Jim, thanks very much for joining me, buddy. Thanks, Sean. Talk to you next week. See ya. Bye. 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 Folks, when we come back, we're going to talk about preparing for the shoot what you can do to pre-visualize your photography, all that and maybe more. I'm not quite sure. Coming up right after this break.
Welcome back, folks. Thanks very much for joining me here this Wednesday evening. So imagine you're a photographer. Imagine you are a very, 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 very talented photographer. Imagine that your photography is taking you all over the world to focus on landscapes. So you're a very, 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 very good landscape photographer. You find out that you are going to be in, there you go, where was this? Hang on a second, hang on, hang on a second. You're going to be in Dubai. And you're going to shoot pictures of the Dubaian desert. I don't know what the right word is. <laughs> the desert in Dubai. Now, for me personally, I'm thinking, mm -hmm, okay, that can't be that interesting. But <clears throat> you start thinking about it. And you start imagining the shots you've seen in the past and the shots you think you can create in the future. Thinking about the shot before you even get to the location, before you unpack your bag at the hotel, uh, before you even make plane reservations, is called pre-visualization. Visualizing it before, pre, you get to the location. You, you push the shutter button. It's something I, I teach in my classes and I think is very important that you imagine the shot before you take the shot. As opposed to just pointing your camera and clicking and hoping you got the shot, you pre-visualize the shot in your, in your mind's eye and then you figure out how you need to create that image, whether it means changing the shutter speed on your camera, changing the aperture, changing the exposure, moving to the left to get that tree branch out of the way, getting higher, getting lower, having more people in your shot, having fewer people in your shot, whatever it might be. One of the things I love about photography that it appeals so much to me is because it satisfies both my creative side but also my technical side. Creatively, visualizing an image, imagining an image, imagining a place, imagining a, a shot, a lighting condition, and then technically using my camera to create that image. <clears throat> using my knowledge of photography, my knowledge of light, my knowledge of the device I'm holding in my hand, and manipulating the light, the location, and the device to create what I saw in my mind's eye. That combination of creative and technical is, for me, really, really cool. I love that aspect of it. So this gentleman's name is, let me just get, this is Joshua Cripps, okay? Joshua is, if he's not world famous, then he bloody well should be. Joshua is an incredible photographer. These are some of his images. His website, joshuacripps.com, J-O-S-H-U-A.com. Incredible, incredible um, landscape images. Check them out if you, if you get a chance. So all kinds of different views from some from uh, planes from ground level from high above the usual i don't want to say usual because they're they're very well done it's one of my favorite shots waterfalls and waves he calls it um i love this long exposure shot of uh the waves um in the water on on this shot so joshua goes to dubai Sorry, he already knows he's going to be in Dubai. And then he finds out that while he's in Dubai, he is going to be at uh, a location where, <clears throat> excuse me, where the solar eclipse is going to happen. The annular solar eclipse, I think, happened this past, uh, let me just check to see. I think it happened this past December. December, yeah, mid December. Found out there would be an annual solar eclipse. He decided to extend his trip to photograph it. He says he spent a crazy amount of planning, a crazy amount of time planning the shoot. So the first thing he did was use an app that I've used called Photo Pills. Pho I don't want to say it's photopills.com. I mean just Photo Pills. Uh, yes, it is. Photopills.com. Photo Pills is a really cool app that allows you to. Not only 
um, see where sunrise and sunset is going to be, moonrise and moon set are going to be, and the path that they're going to be on. But they allow, it allows you to plan that over time. What that means is you can tell or ask Photopills what's going to be at this spot or at that spot in six months' time. And when I say that spot, I mean you can literally go on it and put in an address for some other place. So when I was a few years ago, this is when I first uh, used Photopills, I wanted to find out if the sun was going to set behind a particular monument in Halifax. I'd gone home for a family vacation. And I had this visualization of a sunset over this um, famous structure in Halifax. So I used Photopills to go to the date when I was going to be in Halifax and then tell me, and I put in the address of the place, where's the sun going to fall on that date? Turned out it wasn't going to work then. It might have worked some other time, but it wasn't going to work then. So that allowed me to pre-visualize and find out couldn't do it, can't do it at that particular time. So Photopills, P-I-L-L-S dot com is a great app for this kind of stuff. So he used Photopills to help him pre-plan where he was going to be. But he also had to find out how high the sand dunes in Dubai were going to be. He then had to find out exactly at what time would the eclipse be happening. And luckily for him, it was the eclipse was going to be happening fairly low in the horizon. I think it's six degrees above the horizon. So he knew that the sun was going to be just coming up over the, the sand dunes that, that he wanted to shoot. So then he decided, this is just absolutely incredible, that he didn't want to just shoot uh, an eclipse. He wanted to add an element into it. And the element he was, he's in the desert. He found a, uh, a camel and a camel owner to stand there for the shot. And the shot he got, this is, this, is a, this is a fun shot. This is him and the owner of the camel. You can see the sun rising ju just behind them. The camel owner didn't speak English. <laughs> so he had to draw. I don't know why the guy didn't have a, have a uh, translator with him. But the camel guy didn't speak English. So he had to draw in the sand a representation of what he wanted the camel guy to do. That's not even the shot, although this is my favorite shot. I like this shot even better than the one he has uh, has posted. That's the shot. That is an incredible image. That is utterly magical, and it should win dozens of awards for not just the visualization of the image that he could think that this would be a good image but the idea of being there at that spot he had to figure out exactly how many feet away he could be from the camel and the camel owner to get them at the right size in the image it turned out it was about a thousand feet he had to set up lights uh, Mac Ben says the glow around the camel is amazing he had to set up lights on the other side of the sand dune to get that glow on the camel so that would it would it would come through that way he had to worry about the um f-stop of his uh of his shutter because if it was open too much too much light would come in it might might burn the sensor out of his camera so he had to use um, nd filter neutral density filter and he had to go down 10 stops which, if you know anything about photography, that's just amazing. He's basically put a piece of welder's glass <laughs> in front of his camera to, to, to take this picture. He had to plan all of this stuff, and he only had maybe two or three minutes. The, the eclipse lasted 23 minutes, but this aspect of the eclipse was maybe only two or three minutes. And yet he managed to get some absolutely incredible images in those two or three minutes. And some work better than others. Like I said, I think this one, sorry, 
this one is actually my favorite. I don't know why I like it more than the other one. The other one's a beautiful image, but this one I think is is is, is my favorite image. I think because it's the camels looking up at the eclipse. I think that's why I find this image to be more compelling than than the other ones, even though the other ones are undoubtedly utterly beautiful and uh, you know, spectacular photography. So that's the idea. Think about this is something I try to beat into the heads of people I teach photography. To become a better photographer, you have to start thinking about photography. It's not good enough to have a great camera or a great lens or great light or a great subject. You've got to think about your shots. <clears throat> if you want to become a better photographer, stop just going out and just taking pictures willy-nilly and hoping that something comes out. Taking a thousand pictures and hoping you get ten good ones. You want to start thinking about your photography, pre-visualizing the images that you see, even if you're doing it in the five minutes before you, you push the shutter. One of the things that I saw MacMan says, he's uh, going to be doing some research soon for his next trip in April. Fantastic, MacMan. It's a great idea. And as I've always said, one of the places I go for research is Flickr. Go to Flickr and just do a search for that place or that thing that you're going to visit and sort of get an idea of the lay of the land. Uh, one of the things that we found in Lisbon that I didn't realize was that when we wanted to go up to the uh, Moorish Castle to uh, be up there for sunset, it was because of my research on Flickr that I realized it was quite a walk up there, quite a hike. It's it's at the, If it's not the highest point of land in Lisbon, it's certainly one of, and the location of the entrance isn't very clear. So if we had just gone up half an hour before we thought sunrise, sunset was going to happen, we would have missed it. I made sure we went up an hour and a half, almost two hours ahead of time, so that we could scout, get up there in plenty of time, scout out locations, and look for that sunset shot, that uh, some of the shots I took of Melissa. Um, MacBain says, spray and pray has its time, but you need to think about things. Even 90 seconds of planning can get you this, he says. And let's see if it's what he's posting. Yes, exactly. This, this is a shot that MacBain took when we were in in Lisbon. And you can see the planning that he took. Hang on, let me put this full screen. You've got to pl plan and visualize that shot ahead of time. This is the Belem Castle that we went to in <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, jeez. In uh, in Lisbon, you got to think about these shots ahead of time. You got to see this shot before you push the shutter button in order to get consistently good images. And that's what you're looking for. You're you're not, you're not spray and pray works in fast motion and action and in kids sports or in a football game. But for a lot of the times, focus on your image. Think about your image ahead of time and work at creating what you visualize. And then if you can't figure out why not. For me, in Halifax, I couldn't get the image because the time of day was wrong. The sun wasn't going to fall where I wanted to get it for that shot. But it saved me time using photo pills that I didn't go to the location and stand around waiting for the sun to show up in that spot. I knew because of photo pills it wasn't going to happen. So keep that in mind as you are taking photographs the next time you're out and about. Think about your photography. As always, we appreciate getting emails from you guys. I like getting emails. Send us emails to Sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. Appreciate that, if you would. Uh, our friend Scott Randall says, I agree with you and Jim. Apple News Plus is not useful, at least to me. When it first came out, I looked at it for about 20 minutes. I could not find any reason why I would use it. I gave it the full... 30-day trial, Scott, but I came to the same conclusion. It just wasn't useful enough to me. He's the other thing I believe you mentioned is Macworld Expo. When they stopped having the expo in New York, uh, I really missed it. I went every year and enjoyed it thoroughly. I love visiting the exhibits and meet people I knew. I actually found some people at the exhibits who gave me good information. I found out about All Soft's Disc Warrior there and used it for years. Um, my best to you, you, Melissa, and all the Your Mac lifers. Yeah, it's it's... It's very funny. I actually, um, I mentioned on either last week's show or the show before that um, a lady named Natalie Karras. And Natalie, at, for a long period of time, was Steve Jobs' right hand. 
She was the woman, if you ever saw Steve Jobs, you saw, I said this a few, last week or the week before, she was the woman standing next to Steve Jobs looking decidedly nervous most of the time. She was the one who got Steve to his appointments and, and uh, was his um, invaluable, I wouldn't even say assistant, but partner. Colin Crawford, the guy who used to run um, Mac Publishing, posted a story on Flickr about the 1998 Steve Jobs keynote. And at that time, Colin was the guy who liaisoned with Jobs for Macworld Expo. And it turned out for in 1998, this was only a year after Jobs had come back. He was still ICEO of the company. In 1998, Jobs told Colin Crawford, be prepared that I might not make this January's keynote. Colin like, oh shit, why not? Well, it turned out Jobs' wife was scheduled to give birth at some time during that week. And Jobs said, you know, I'm not going to miss the birth of my child. I'm staying home. If it happens, I'm going to be staying home for the birth of my child. And Colin Crawford was like, yeah, okay, fine, dude, no problem. So Phil Schiller was practicing the keynote. Jobs and Schiller, side by side, were practicing the keynote. Well, the rumor got out that Jobs wasn't going to be at the 1998 Macworld Expo, that he wasn't going to be giving the keynote. And, of course, everyone lost their minds. Everyone a lot of people assumed it was because Jobs was going to step down from the company, that the company wasn't doing very well. This was a year after Jobs came back, and he had gotten a look at the books and realized this company's going under, and Jobs was going to resign as ICEO. That was the rumor. And because of that rumor, Apple stock price went in the toilet, just zooming down. Because people were just thinking, oh, Apple will have no CEO or whatever. So I heard from a source that, no, 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 it's not because he's stepping down. It's because of this birth thing. And I was like, oh, well, shit. Why doesn't Apple say that? Why wouldn't Apple just come right out and say, hey, folks, don't worry about it. Jobs isn't leaving. He just wants to be home for the birth of his child. And everyone would have everyone gone, oh, cool. Okay, no problem. But Apple didn't do that. Apple let the, the stock continue to slide over a fairly long period of time. And meanwhile, I'm over here going, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. It's just because he's having a baby. I got ripped by the Mac media because, and this is subsequent to other things that happened with Jobs, was very funny, that I was prying into his private life. I was interfering i was talking out of school and that might have been correct if jobs was a private individual he wasn't he was a public person and this event was affecting the stock of the company now remember in 98 97 98 apple was still on very very shaky ground after jobs came back it was found out that Apple had about 90 days worth of cash in the bank. In other words, if they didn't make, they didn't sell another thing, they had 90 days of operating capital. That on day 91, they weren't going to be able to pay their employees. So the situation was very, very dire. So Apple couldn't afford negative, unnecessary negative publicity. So I'm sitting there going, no, don't panic, don't panic. It, it, everything's fine. Jobs is, is just going to be at the birth of his child. So rip, rip, rip. Okay, fine. The morning of the keynote shows up. Now, if you were press, or you know, if, if you were the average person, you get, you stayed up all night long. You went into a keynote lineup at 10 o'clock at night for the next morning for the keynote. There's a limited number of seats. If you were lucky enough to be press, you got up at 6 a.m., you made your way down to uh, the Javits Center in, in, in New York City. There was a press area for you. IDG had coffee and baked goods and that kind of stuff. You hung around with the other press people. And you waited for Apple to herd you into the keynote. Well, I didn't do that because Jobs wasn't going to be there. So why get up at 6 a.m. to watch Phil Schiller give a speech? I got no interest in watching Phil Schiller give a keynote. 
I stayed in bed. I got two extra hours of sleep. Woo! 8.30 rolls around. I hop in a cab. I go down to the Javits Center. I got my badge. I walk into the Moscone Center in the Macworld Expo. I go over to the Apple booth with some friends I know from Apple. And they were like, Sean, why, why are you here? I said, well, you know, Jobs isn't giving the keynote, so no point in me getting up. I'll just watch it here because they had it up on the big screen in the Apple booth. And they start smirking. And I'm like, what's going on? Nothing. Just you can have a seat over there. We sit down and Colin Crawford comes out and Crawford starts the introductions and talking about the success of Macworld Expo. Blah, 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 blah. And now, to give you the keynote, Steve Jobs. What the hell? Well, it turned out Jobs' wife had given birth the night before. He jumped on Larry Ellis's Gulf Stream, flew to New York City, and gave the keynote. Uh, was that with the iMac announcement? 98 Was 98 the iMac announcement? It could have been, Mac Man. It could have been. So, again, I get ripped again. Hi, ah, you're wrong. Da, da, da. Okay, fine. Whatever. Anyway, this is a long story, but it gets down to the, the point. I wrote on Colin Crawford's Facebook post. I said, I respected him as well, but because the rumors were swirling and he wasn't going to attend, everyone was, was speculating, but what does this mean for Apple? Speculation was that he was going to step down. I felt Apple should have said exactly what you did. Jobs might not make the keynote because of the birth. It would have been no big deal for Apple PR to nip the rumors in the bud. But they let the stock slide and the rumors compound. So because I knew the truth, I reported it was because of the childbirth and I got ripped for it. He did show up and put his usual fantastic put on his usual fantastic keynote. No harm done. Well, Natalie Karras, the PR person, the right hand man of well, right right hand woman of, of jobs, pipes up in this Facebook thread and says, Sean, you're right. He could have easily made an honest or humorous comment that I fully intend to be at both events, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if I have to choose, do the right thing, I'll choose the birth of my daughter over work, as everyone should. Natalie says, uh, 2020 hindsight is easy. And by the way, this comment is off the record. <laughs> so I thanked, I thanked Natalie and said, vindication is mine. <laughs> after, what, 18 years? Oh, geez, after 22 years? Finally, finally. Vindication was mine. Uh, so it was the Mac. No, um, um, it was the it was the ninety eight keynote. It was New York City, so it would have been in July. Uh, the iMac. The iMac was announced, I believe. No, it was announced as, as uh, Sherry says. iMac was its own event, and then it went on sale the week of Macworld Expo. So they they showed it off at a special event, and then it wasn't on sale for another May, June, July, August. So another two or three months. And that was at that keynote, or that Macworld Expo, the folks could go in and touch and feel and play around with, with the IMAX. Thanks very much, Sherry. Appreciate that. So yeah, it was, it was good to... Uh, after all those years, to uh, have someone from Apple going, you know what? You were right, dude. Folks, that's it for tonight's show. As always, I want to say thanks to our good friend Jim Downpro of The Loop at loopinsight.com. And, uh, appreciate him being on the show. Thanks to all of our listeners, whether you're listening via the archive or tuned in live. You folks in the RC chat room, thank you guys very much for being here each and every week. Until next week, folks, I've been Sean King, and you've been listening to Your Mac Life. See ya! <laughs>